here's your host, Alex Garrett. And welcome inside to this edition of the Alex Garrett Podcast Network. It's the one leg up feature once again. And right off the bat here, I want to give one leg up to the 106th Rescue Wing. Yes, they deserve a lot of kudos tonight as the West Hampton-based New York National Guard transport plane is in the rescue search for the Titan submersible. You know, the submersible that had five people aboard it that has gone missing on an expedition to the Titanic wreckage. As ironic and as tragic as this is, that the Titan submersible is meeting the same fate, possibly, that the Titanic is, it is good to see that there is a rescue wing from Long Island out here uh, helping out the cause in the North Atlantic. The 106th Rescue Wing, give them a shout out, a kudos today. Six crew members, one combat rescue officer, and four parachute jumpers, and two crew chiefs who's been on the scene since 6.30 p.m. Monday night and has been searching and, and conducted search operations, according to Captain Charon Campbell, a spokesperson for the New York National Guard unit. Kudos to Michael O'Keefe of Newsday for picking up on this story. It's kind of funny. I mentioned a while ago that I, I wanted to enhance my observation skills because that's what my dad did and sure enough here was a news day two dollars fifty cents by the way and uh, i'm like well let me pick it up only to tell you this great story about the 106th rescue wing in a trying to rescue a very unfortunate situation i mean lives are at stake hours are at stake here but credit to the 106th rescue wing of the New York National Guard transport plane, uh, transport and New York National Guard. And that's where we start tonight on the One Leg Up with Alex Scare podcast, because in just a couple minutes, I'm going to play you my conversation with Tom McMillan. Now, Tom McMillan, okay, he is actually just retired from the Pittsburgh Penguins after a 25 year career in sports media. And he's talking about history. He's talking about the American flag that was the basis of Francis Scott Key's Star Spangled Banner. So don't miss that. You don't want to miss that momentarily. But the other thoughts I had today was the top of Newsday, the lead story in Newsday. About $3.3 billion being shelled out. So a cable, let me get this right for you. A cable could go along Long Beach, providing power that would hit upstate New York and would empower upstate New York, I should say. Yes, Kathy Hochul and Albany signing off on this bill for wind farm cable land that would make landfall and connect to the power grid and it would all go through Long Beach. I think it's kind of crazy. And they say this is to make energy goals of 2030. And then if they don't do this cable that would run 20 miles <laughs> offshore. Starting in Long Beach, keep in mind. Um, they wouldn't meet their goal. It's insanity. You talk about oceanography, this is insane. A $3 billion project to send offshore energy to the Bronx and Westchester. Windmills. When when has that gone right? I ask you on the Alex Garrett Podcast Network. A plan to bring Long Island power upstate using a miles long cable that would make landfall in Long Beach and run to its substation in Island Park and then what 20 miles more offshore it's insane it's insane so I hope I hope someone 
has sense in Albany not to let this happen. I'm going to cite that article on uh, the description of the, the, the podcast tonight. And when we come back, when we come back on One Leg Up with Alex Garrett, one man who has one leg up on history is Tom McMillan. And he's written a book about a 209-year-old American flag that has been preserved right up into 2023 and hopefully beyond at the Smithsonian. He'll tell us all about it next on the Alex Garrett Podcast Network. Well, you know, this show should really start with the Star Spangled Banner because, yes, last week was Flag Day, but I believe, and maybe my next guest believes as well, that uh, in a very patriotic month of June, you know, it is Flag Day. There are some patriotic moments of this month, but the conversation about Flag Day shouldn't just end on Flag Day, and I want to start there with my next guest, Tom McMillan, who uh, we'll get to his book in one second, but Tom, you've written about the oldest Star Spangled Banner that's still around. Tell us what you've written uh, through post Yeah, the, the, the book, Our Flag, was still there. I was just fascinated about the flag from Fort McHenry that our national anthem, everybody knows that our national anthem was written about it. But pretty much when I looked at it, I think all people really know is, okay, it flew, they won the battle, Francis Key saw it, wrote a song. But that flag still exists 209 years later. It's at the Smithsonian. And I think people visited and... And we just know, often the way history is, we just know a snippet of it. I thought I was looking into it. I thought, this is a fascinating story of the journey of that flag, the, what I consider the most famous flag in U.S. history in those 200 plus years from Fort McHenry in Baltimore to the Smithsonian and all the ebbs and flows in between. And I got to ask you, how did you track this down? I mean, you weren't around in 1814, but how did you track down <laughs> the remainder of this uh, beautiful uh, story here? Yeah, well, I went to the Fort McHenry in Baltimore. They have good resources. The Smithsonian in D.C. was tremendous. Uh, they had about 400 pages of research. I don't think many people have ever asked them for it. Uh, I was able to pour through that. And then I was was really lucky and made it really personal, Alex, because I was able to track down some direct descendants of George Armistead, who was the commander at Fort McHenry and the guy who thought of the flag and actually took it home after the battle kind of in violation of army regulations, but he took it home and it remained in the possession of that family for 90 years, which is one of the reasons that it exists today. So the, those family members had some tidbits and photos and really interesting things that, that made it personal for me. It was a patriotic journey for me. That was cool. So Fort McHenry, Smithsonian, National Archives, and family descendants. Tom and Tom McMillan, he is the author of Our Flag Was Still There. The Star Spangled Banner that survived the British in 200 years and the Armistead family. Now, we'll get to the Armistead family a little more, but people may say, well, why are you doing this a week after Flag Day? But a story like this, it just shows that the American history continues even after one day a year, right? Absolutely. And, you know, and we're patriotic on the 4th of July. And this battle at Fort McHenry, when Key saw the flag, was actually in September, September 13th and 14th, overnight. He saw it the the morning of the 14th. So this is a a spreading story. And and the journey of the flag isn't just one day either. I mean, a lot of the book is how how and why it survived, a rather incredible story. So when you go to the Smithsonian today and you see it, I I hope if people read it, they'll appreciate everything, all the people who, who were involved to get it here over those uh, those centuries that we can still look at it. And it's really dramatic when you see it in, in when you see it in the museum. When you say spread out, no no kidding. There are more than eight feet of material, aka the largest uh, American flag during the war of eighteen twelve, cut into small pieces. Now, is it not American to it, would this be considered desecrating the flag by cutting into pieces? Give us your thoughts on that. Well, it would have been. Yeah, part of the story, again, we, we, there are different uh, traditions in different centuries. We have to put ourselves back at that time. Yeah, for the, for the listeners, uh, the flag originally was 30 feet by 42 feet. Huge flag. At the Smithsonian, it's now 30 by 34. It's, it's eight feet shorter. It's because in the mid-1800s, the Armistead ladies, his wife and his daughter, 
would do something that would be, as you said, would be considered sacrilegious to us today, but was commonplace back then. They would cut off pieces of the flag and give them as souvenirs to battle veterans, uh, maybe their families, dignitaries in Baltimore. And over over several decades, they cut away eight feet. I was talking to one of the archivists at the, uh, at the Smithsonian, and she said, yeah, you know, we would be aghast at that today. You would, could not do that today. But back then, in the 1800s, that's what you did. So – they, they they cut away pieces of the flag, and some of those have been returned to the Smithsonian. They have some of those pieces uh, available as well, but some of them are still in, in, in homes and little museums around the country. Tell us about that. Where does the flag live today? It's at the, at the National Museum of American History uh, in, in, in Washington, D.C. with the Smithsonian. Actually, about 50, you lose track of time. In, in the early 60s, uh, the Smithsonian itself was just one museum back then. Now it's multiple. But it, it was just one museum, and everything was getting cluttered. And they decided back then that they would create a museum just for American history, and they built it around the Star Spangled Banner. Flag Hall was on the second floor, and it's still there on the second floor. They, they did a massive uh, renovation uh, about 15 years ago in 2008. It's really dramatic the way they've done it because you have to take care of that textile that's 209 years old. They had to do a lot of work on it. but. It's still there. So, people, you know, in those museums in D.C. are free. People go in every day. And I went down there several times. And uh, and sometimes, you know, when you write, you get writer's block. And I, I live in Pittsburgh. But if I got that, I, I would drive down to D.C. and go see it. And I was inspired just by looking at it and thinking, you know, nobody's really told this story beginning to end. I want to be the one who who's able to tell the story. Well, it seems like this is the flag that the rockets red glare, bombs bursting in the air, were reflecting. Yeah. And I got to ask you, were are there descendants of Armistead that, that talked to you? How did you get this uh, non- behind-the-scenes look, if you will? Yeah, well, I did. I, I, I cold-wrote them letters. I, I did some research. Uh, you can find a lot of things on Ancestry.com. And I just cold-wrote them letters, explained to them who I was and what I was doing. And they were extremely gracious. Some folks in Philadelphia and some folks in, in Florida, they were excited that someone was talking about it. And uh, they had me to their homes, and they provided – they were very – very great. She provided some photos for the book, provided some documents. Actually, because of this, Alex, one of the things I'm proudest of, a little side view here, is because of the research, I was able to put some of them in touch with the people at the Smithsonian, and they have donated several of George Armistead's items now to the Smithsonian. They, they were in their home. He had, he had in his home, I saw them in, in Philadelphia, they had his original U.S. Army commissions that were signed by get this, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, and James Madison, they were in their home, and they had an 1816 painting of him. And those things now, the Smithsonian was very excited, and the, the Armistead decided, you know, we have these in our home. It, it, it's nice, but if we give it to the Smithsonian, we know it will be preserved for all time. So the, the Smithsonian authenticated those pieces, and they have now been donated down there. So it's kind of a cool little thing for me as an author. It wasn't the purpose of the book, but because of that, I was able to put those two together, and those items are not, will now be available to the American public. I got to ask you this because, you know, we just kind of went out the gate here about the flag, but you are Tom McMillan. And for those who are just listening to the show for the first time, listening to you for the first time, give us some insight into who Tom McMillan is. You are a historian and an author. Yes, I, uh, I actually just retired from my profession, which was in sports media and communications, believe it or not. I, uh, I was a writer and a broadcaster, and then I worked as VP of communications for the Pittsburgh Penguins of the NHL for 25 years. But history was always my passion. And, and I, I, my wife and I volunteered at historic sites. And as I got on in years, I, I thought, I can write a little bit. I'll try to write some books. And this is actually my fourth book. I wrote one on Flight 93, the September 11th flight that crashed. Uh, I live in Pittsburgh, so it crashed about 100 miles from where I live. And two on the Battle of Gettysburg. I'm a total Civil War nerd. But this one, uh, there's an Armistead family member who's famous at Gettysburg. He was involved in Pickett's Charge. And by researching that book is when I really stumbled across some of this information. And I thought, this is the kind of story that I want, that I want to do. So uh, sports media and communications was, was my profession, but history and history writing is, is my hobby and will continue to be so. All right, a little side note, because my dad raised me in sports, and we were at Lemieux's, what we thought was his last game against the Rangers back at the Igloo, uh, what, 30 yeah. years ago or so? So there's a little history there. Yeah. How about that? Yes. <laughs> So I, when you talk about Penguins history, i got to ask you, I mean, 25 years you saw them win the Cup with Crosby, and, and 
We'll see. They've kind of waned a little bit here, but are they going to be a force this season? Yeah, well, it's you know, there's an ebb and flow of sports. They they have have beaten back the curve because they made the playoffs for 16 straight years. This past year was the first year they missed in 17 years. That's almost impossible to do. You you can't in the salary cap area. You re, it's really hard to do that. So just that sustaining excellence for that long. I mean, you can't stay on top forever. But Crosby and Malkin and Latang are still here, and there's a new GM, so they're gonna they're gonna try to retool and and take another run. But it, it has really been a golden era, and I was. Very privileged to have a front row view with those Lemieux teams, which I covered for uh, the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, and then the Crosby teams, which I, where I was involved as an executive uh, to be part of those Stanley Cups, one of the, some of the great uh, memories of my life, obviously. It's amazing that I brought you on to talk about the American flag, and here we are talking about the Penguins, but I've kind of <laughs> had a bit of a history with them as well. Um, and, of course, McCutcheon now in Pittsburgh. The Pirates have a, come along now this year as well. We'll have to see what happens there. Yeah, it's a, it's a good sports town, and it was an easy – if you love sports, which I did, and loved writing, which I did, it was easy to get motivated to get into that kind of career. But, Alex, I, when, when they would say – ask about this history stuff, I would say for most people, sports is their escape from their real job, their escape from their life. And I'd say when you work in sports, you need an escape from it. And hist- so history was my sports. That's what I did in my downtime. And it was a love of history for many, many years before I started writing that, that led to this. And now in retirement, uh, this is really what, I, what I'm doing. And to tell this story, uh, you know, be able to tell this patriotic story, I try to, you know, touch, touch stories that maybe haven't been told before. And this was one that really hadn't been. And, and I think uh, you appreciate it, too. As a history lover, at least half the fun is the research and learning. And then you have to sit down and write. But I learned so much myself writing this book and I was I'm a pretty good student of history and I was astounded at how little I knew about this flag story so I thought I, 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 I hope... obviously uh, not every day you get to go into a, a, an army base and a, and a fort so is Fort McHenry the only base you've been to oh no I mean it's Fort McHenry is essentially a national park it's for the National Park Service so uh, I, I had visited there plenty of times before uh, just through my life, whenever you're in Baltimore, you, I always went to Fort McHenry, not, never thinking I was going to write a book. Uh, so it, it's, a, it's a special place because the, the walls of the fort are still there. I mean, you can stand there and look out on the water in Baltimore Harbor, and, almost, and you can see where a key ship was and imagine what was happening that day. And the big fly, flag flies over the fort. So it's, uh, you know, it's a former military base, but now it's a, you know, they call it a national historic site, but it, it's, it's basically run by the National Park Service, uh, free to the public. There's, there's no charge to go to Fort McHenry. As a historic site, though, I know they can't really change much. I mean, I don't know if we're getting into the base or not, but it, are there relics from the base that you can see at the park? Well, the, the, the outer walls of the fort are still there. Now, some of them had to have been repaired over the years. Again, the, the fort continued in existence after the War of 1812, it was uh, it was pretty much a Union prison during the, the Civil War. The Federal Army used it and was used into the 1800s. But yes, the 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 outer structure of the fort is still there, and they have the guns placed uh, or replica guns, obviously placed where those guns used to be. So it's set up uh, it's set up the way it looked uh, during the battle in September of 1814 that that Key would have seen from the water. So you really get it's kind of an eerie feeling when you go there. They've done a great job of, of preserving. They know where the footprint is of the fort. And, and so the visitor center is, is off a little bit and you walk over and, and, uh, and, and, and they, they always have a flag raising ceremony every day. The, the, the flag there, the, the idea of the flag is really the focus of what they do with the program. All right. Well, I got to ask you this. Do you know how they folded this, this huge American flag at the end of the day, even when there was no battle? Cause obviously that's a big part of the military is the folding of the flag, the, <laughs> taking it down at the end of the day type of uh, ceremony. It is. I'm not sure. I, I, I'll tell you, I don't know the details about that from the early 1800s. My guess is they weren't as precise as they are now. I think those, I think those traditions and regulations developed over time. Remember, the, the War of 1812 was only, was only 36 years after the Declaration of Independence. I mean, we were still a really young country. And here we are at war with England again. So I think, you know, the country was just in its embryonic stages, both governmentally and tradition-wise. So I'm not really sure, but I don't think it was as precise back then as it is now. 
uh, certainly uh, now there are, there are very precise regulations of what you of what you would do with the flag. So this flag, uh, it, it's part of this 209 year old flag that Key saw. I mean, part of it was the Armistead ladies and, and his descendants did protect it, but oh, there were times, there were months when it was just rolled up and put in a, a canvas sack. They didn't have the technology or the knowledge of flag preservation that we did today. So. Uh, they probably did some things that ended up uh, causing some damage, but they wouldn't have known that. They didn't have that information. They were they did the best they could, and they certainly did well enough that the flag survived. And then it's it's had two major rehab projects: one in the early 1900s and one in the early 2000s. And now they're convinced that it's gonna it's gonna exist for uh, for many many decades, if not centuries, into the future. All right, I gotta ask you this, Tom, because obviously. Um, you say you have documents and letters. Do we get to see the words of George Armistead and the plans of him unfolding in this book? Take the yeah, oh, out. absolutely. I, I get into his. It was a it was a distinguished military family. Armistead had been in some sort of the military since the year 1680 back in, back in Virginia. He and three of his brothers were professional U.S. Army officers. So yes, I he took over the fort in 1813, a year before the battle. That's when he ordered the flag. So we do the build up. The war is going on, but it hasn't come down to Baltimore. So yes, that whole summer they know the British are coming. They don't know exactly when. Really, do, and then I I have. Uh, I was able to obtain his post-battle report that he wrote maybe 10 days after the battle where he describes what happens. And I, I, uh, I, I quote that extensively. I, sometimes you don't want to use long quotes in your books. You want to write around it. But that, I thought that stuff was so important that I wanted to let his words tell that story rather than mine. So those things you know, were available. It's a little easier to do research now with the, with the Internet. You can go online. But not a lot of people have seen them. And, uh, and so I think some of the information, even though it's 200 years old, is really going to be new to a lot of, a lot of readers who, again, just know kind of the really top line of this story at Fort McHenry with Francis Scott Key. Well, why I love this month is because not only a flag day, but I believe it's the birthday of the Army. I mean, there's a lot going on as far as patriotic, yeah. and I feel like you, you probably touch on that as well. Yeah, the, the U.S. Army was – or the Continental Congress formed the Army in uh, in June of – 1775. That's when they appointed Washington the first general. So it all it all ties in. Um, there's 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 a lot that happened this when you look at this period of June and go into that first week of July with the with the July in the Battle of Gettysburg, the first week of July. There's really a lot of American history that has happened in this three or four or five week period. Having said that, you can probably take any five week period in there. You know, we have a lot of history in our country, but this is this is a I think a patriotic time, and it was a nice time to focus on the flag. You are a historian. Uh, tell us about the other books you've written as well, just to get people uh, up to speed on the work of Tom McMillan. Yeah, I worked the first book when, when I took a shot to try to do this. wasn't sure if I could be successful. It was on Flight 93, the September 11th flight, uh, where the where the passengers and crew fought back. Uh, it crashed in Shanksville, Pennsylvania, which – and my interest was we were all affected by 9-11, those of us alive at the time. But it was very – I mean, it was only 100 miles from Pittsburgh, so I would go out there and look at the site. And about 10 years later, I'd realized, you know, there had been a lot written about what happened in New York and D.C., but not much really written about Shanksville. And so I really wanted to dig into that flight, and I talked to some family members, and it was quite an emotional journey to write that book. Uh, and that was my first one. It's still for sale, and they have it at the Flight 93 National Memorial. And then I ended up writing two books on the Battle of Gettysburg. I just always, I've been studying Gettysburg for 30 years. Uh, went there as a kid. One was on uh, five. Actually, there were five young men who grew up in Gettysburg and ended up fighting for the Confederate Army in the Battle of Gettysburg. They were foreign invaders in their hometown and nobody had written that it was so i called it the title of that is gettysburg rebels and then i wrote uh, another G gettysburg armistead and hancock there's armistead again there was a confederate general and a union general uh lewis armistead and winfield scott hancock very good friends before the war not only did not only did they face each other in the war they faced each other in pickett's charge at gettysburg and just writing i thought that that encapsulized the whole history of the civil war you have these two guys who served together in the army as friends in the U.S. Army, uh, fought together in the Mexican War, and here they are in the most famous attack of the Civil War, the Battle of Gettysburg, facing each other, and they both were wounded by the other's troops. So I, I, I do try to dig into some of these stories that in my old newspaper days would have been feature stories and expand on those. Uh, so hopefully people he, who 
aren't even really into the total like deep history of the Battle of Gettysburg or the War of 1812. This is a story that maybe you can enjoy. All right, I got to ask you this because, again, I'm a sports guy. Uh, so you went from the ice rink, the sport, you know, the rink, the skating rink to, to maybe a, a Gettysburg reenactment. Is that kind of the vibe I'm getting from you? I w- the, when, and whenever the, the Penguin season ended, uh, whether that was with a loss or a Stanley Cup, I, the, the next weekend I went to Gettysburg. <laughs> that, was how, that was how I, I uh, calmed down from the season. So, yeah, I always uh, – it's, it's only about three and a half hours from where I live, so it's, 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 it's an easy trip. Uh, it's always been a big part of my life, and that's why it's kind of interesting at the end now that I've figured out writing books – you know, to, to be able to write about it and enjoy it that way, to, to do that research in it. And actually, there's a there's a pr- productivity to it. And uh, I want to keep going. But uh, this book uh, on the flag just came out. So I'm focusing on this for a while and doing some interviews like this and podcasts and uh, book talks. And and uh, it's it, it's a fun part of it, getting out and meeting people and talking to them about this story. Again, that a lot of them tell me I've already heard that they didn't know a lot about. So that it's it's rewarding to know that, that you, you're providing some information that maybe people who are interested in history didn't know before. All right. That leads me to my next question. I love how you set that up because I got to ask and I've never really asked a historian this. But what's it mean to you to preserve the American history through your writing? Oh, it's it's it's. I've had a great professional career, but this is the most rewarding part of my life. You you leave a little bit of yourself, and I, I've always loved American history so much. And now you're able to make you're able to make it's a very small contribution, but you're able to make a contribution. And years from now, people, you know, I, I always said sometimes in the modern context, if we don't do the research now we might not be able to find those things in 50 years. So you're also thinking maybe no one would ever have looked at this Star Spangled Banner story. Maybe no one have, would have looked at the Armistead family. I just kind of stumbled into it. And, and it, it is, it is very rewarding. You don't, it's a hobby for me. You don't do it. You might make a little bit of money. That's not your motivation. You do it because you love it and, and you can interact with people and see that they react to it. That's the best part of this. It's, it's having people, read it and learn and getting that feedback uh, that, that keeps you going. All right, then i got to ask you this, because obviously you've now covered Baltimore, you've covered Gettysburg. What about the history of the Steel City? Will you ever cover your hometown Pittsburgh in, in the book? <laughs> I don't know. People have asked me that. It's right in my book of Pittsburgh. Uh, who, who knows? I'm, I'm, I'm wide open. One thing I can't tell you, Alex, though, there are always people, when, especially friends and family members, you know, when they know you write books, they say, why don't you write about this? Why don't you write about that? There have, there have been a couple of ideas that I had that I started, and I just didn't feel it. Even though I was interested in the topic, you re- it's a lot of work. It's fun. It's a hobby. I enjoy it. But it is a lot of work. It's a lot of time, and you have to love the story. And you kind of know that as soon as you're, you're a little bit in, maybe a couple of chapters in. I've started a couple of books, a couple of chapters, and this doesn't feel right. So um, I think that's part of it. You, you have to love it. So uh, you never know. Uh, the next book is never planned. I've always allowed myself to stumble onto these these other books. So we'll see what happens. There's certainly a lot of history here in Pittsburgh, but there, there might just be something of, uh, of of traveling for research that intrigues me too. So I'm uh, I'm an open canvas on that. Well, if you ever come to New York, let us know. We'd love to talk with you more. One last thing, favorite rendition of the national anthem that I could play to end the segment today. You know, I just – there are so many of them. So There have been so many great ones at sporting events. You hear the Whitney Houston people talks about that, talk about that. I just – I like the straight, dramatic, patriotic one. I really do. Um, you know, people have had great versions of it, but just – it's, the, it's the, the song. When I hear the music and I think about the flag, that's what inspires me. So while I know there are some famous ones, I just like the, you know, the, the basic, straightforward version of the anthem. Uh, the one I, the one that I grew to, grew to know and love as a kid. So I don't know if that's a that's a very exciting answer, but uh, I just uh, it, it it makes me it makes me stand at attention whenever I hear it. Tom McMillan, thanks so much, and we'll definitely have you back on the Alex Garrett Podcast Network. 